Welcome to the presentation of the paper, Supporting Gender Inclusion and Adolescent Voice Change in School Choirs. My name is Heather Morecambe, and I would like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to present today. Choral participation in Australian schools is unfortunately on the decline. While there are various reasons for this decline, Studies have shown that how adolescents experience voice change can significantly impact their future involvement. Consequently, voice change has become a focused area of choral research. The term adolescent voice change refers to the stage of development where the production of sound, in this case singing, is impacted by the physical growth of the vocal mechanism. In adolescent choral and voice change literature, gender-based practice is a source of controversy. There is significant evidence to suggest that historical, social, political and religious perspectives embedded in Western art music culture have profoundly influenced choral practices rather than empirical evidence. Gender-based practice adopts a binary perception of gender. First, identifying singers by their sex, male or female, then into voice parts based on this gender. An example of this can be observed in the formation SATB, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, soprano, alto for females, and tenor, bass for males. While there is a large body of literature on adolescent voice change, much of this research is based in gendered practice. In contrast to adolescent voice change research, a growing body of feminist literature has emerged over the last decade, advocating inclusive practice that aims to support gender identity and voice change in gender diverse adults. This research troubles male centric and binary perceptions within choral settings. It criticizes voice change research for attempting to alter the behavior or identity of singers rather than adapting practice to accommodate them. This research has found that gender oriented practice reduces participation, promotes gendered stereotypes, and provides limited opportunities for singers who don't identify within these gendered boundaries. Although research has been conducted on gender inclusive teaching strategies that support adults, there are gaps in the research that apply gender inclusive practice and teaching strategies to support adolescent voice change. Research has identified that due to recent discourse, issues such as gender diversity, gender identity and gendered stereotypes are becoming more prominent in schools. However, choral programs are further complicated due to gendered associated practice. This research design explores how understandings of gender and inclusive practices can inform teaching strategies of Australian choral teachers through an examination of the existing literature. In turn, this research aims to accommodate and increase participation of adolescent choral singers and those experiencing voice change through the introduction of gender inclusive research and perspectives. To begin, I would like to outline my experiences that have led me to the investigation of this topic. I first became interested in this topic through my personal experiences as a choral teacher investigating strategies to accommodate male voice change. I had observed that as males progressed throughout adolescence, they began withdrawing from choir, leaving a significant gender imbalance. We have all, at some point in our lives, been in the presence of a horrified adolescent boy whose voice has just suddenly cracked or broken in the middle of a conversation, or even during a song, jumping from soprano to bass in a split second. This vocal instability is a symptom of voice change. Due to this audible impact on the singing voice, a large body of literature has been developed over the last century concerning male adolescent voice change. Historically, due to the belief that singing through vocal development could damage the vocal mechanism and confuse singers, males were required to abstain from singing until their voices fully developed. 
However, studies conducted by key voice change researchers have found that singing during change actually strengthens the vocal mechanism, supporting a smoother transition between childhood and adult singing registers. Voice change is a natural sequential process that can be understood to keep adolescents singing through this time. Throughout the investigation of the literature, I discovered a much smaller body of feminist research that emerged in the late 20th century. This research found that females also experience voice change. However, due to its subtle nature, it commonly goes unnoticed and therefore unsupported, despite the greater number of females involved in choral programs. In my teaching, Adolescent female students had often reported ongoing discomfort in their singing, causing their voices to reduce in range or become hoarse, often concluding they are unwell. This was a concern that I recalled experiencing as an adolescent singer that gradually resolved as I grew into adulthood. This experience was supported by literature that found manifestations of female voice change include voice cracking, huskiness, incomplete phonation, and decreased range. Variation in voice quality was more of an issue for females rather than a shift in vocal range as demonstrated in males. While the changing female voice offers some difficulties for choral teachers, the dramatic impact on the phonation of the male changing voice has proven to be especially demanding as it interferes notably on performance. For this reason, choral teachers commonly experience unease when dealing with male voice change. Female voice change can create significant discomfort for the singer, but it's less audible. Therefore, there is less impact on the repertoire, and consequently, females are primarily overlooked. However, Sweet and Parker's research has shown that the anxiety experienced by females undergoing voice change was equally as severe as the anxiety experienced by their male peers. A lack of understanding regarding the sudden erratic behaviour of their voices often leads females to come to their own conclusions, assuming that they are unwell or even questioning their general competence as singers. So, what does this tell us? It tells us that all singers in our choirs, regardless of gender, experience and are impacted by voice change and therefore everybody needs to be supported. Throughout my investigation of the literature, it became evident that the most significant barriers to choral participation were commonly associated with gender. Historically, male voices have dominated choirs. However, modern stereotypes labelling singing as feminine has shown to be the most significant barrier to male choral participation in Australia. As males are fewer in number, the literature focuses on improving the participation of males rather than accommodating the larger number of females. Research by O'Toole found choral teachers also direct more attention to males in a choral setting as they're likely to have fewer peers supporting their voice part. Practice that only catered to male voice change was identified as harmful to females as they often remain unsupported. Gendered formations such as SATB that are suited to adult voices were found to not reflect the vocal range or changing voices of adolescents. In 2017, an Australian study examining the vocal development of adolescents reported 16 different vocal development stages across males and females. The singer's vocal range proved to be consistently lower than those recorded in the United States and the United Kingdom. In addition, this research demonstrated a variety of ages in each vocal development stage, suggesting that age is not an indicator of voice type. No females could be identified as soprano or alto, and all demonstrated a comparable range and quality across both voice types. There were no males in this study who fit the adult criteria of tenor. This research suggests that the adolescent choir is a unique ensemble and should be treated as such. Formations such as SATB 
reinforce gendered stereotypes, further excluding students who do not identify within these boundaries. This is further complicated with adolescents as they are precariously negotiating identity development. These findings were significant as I began to challenge the notion of gender in my teaching practice and how, as a person who identifies as female, I contribute to the discourse that enforces gender binaries in the classroom. As a choral teacher, I wanted to ensure my teaching strategies were inclusive beyond the boundaries of gender. I found a growing body of feminist literature advocating inclusive practice to support gender identity and voice change in adults. These theorists have researched teaching strategies that aim to accommodate gender identity of um, adult transgender singers and those undergoing hormone replacement therapy. According to Aguirre, hormone replacement therapy triggers a voice change similar to that experienced during adolescence. Due to these similarities, Aguirre suggests these teaching strategies are equally effective for adolescents experiencing voice change and therefore can be applied to adolescent choirs. Although research has been carried out on gender inclusion and teaching strategies to support adult voice change, no single study exists that utilises gender inclusive practice to inform teaching strategies for adolescent voice change. I will now provide an overview of the feminist literature I consulted to investigate gender inclusive strategies that could be used in an Australian school setting. Gender inclusive practice recognises that people are not so easily divided into two unified groups. It aims to disrupt the concept of gender, allowing people to construct their own identities. Conversely, binary perceptions of gender assume that sex dictates gender identity, which feminism criticises for creating an asymmetric power balance by placing labels and stereotypes on singers that may conflict with their identities. Feminist choral researchers have devised teaching strategies that aim to accommodate adult diverse gendered singers and singers undergoing hormone replacement therapy that research has shown to trigger a voice change comparable to that experienced by adolescents. The literature has found these teaching strategies promote gender inclusion and choral, in a choral setting in which Aguirre suggests are highly transferable to the choral classroom. This study design draws on strategies that emerge from two approaches to deconstruct gendered binaries. The first approach arises from the studies of three feminist researchers, O'Toole, Sweet and Wolf Hill. These studies aim to deconstruct hierarchical power relations that impose the conductor's dominant perspective of gender onto the singers. Hierarchy is deconstructed through collaborative and effective learning strategies that include group discussion and the reconfiguration of choral formations that aim to reduce the conductor's control as the primary decision maker. The second approach deconstructs gender binaries by promoting gender inclusive strategies that include the use of gender inclusive language, uniforms, voice parts, choral formations and repertoire selection. Through the investigation of this literature, this research design aims to offer simple strategies that, are, that choral teachers can employ to support gender inclusion and voice change in a choral setting. I will begin by discussing the strategy, collaboration and effective learning emerging from feminist research. Effective learning ensures that content relates to students' interests and motivations, so that learning is relevant to their lives. Wolf Hill implemented effective learning through collaboration, where students were invited to participate in all aspects of class. This strives to, to displace the typical top-down teacher-student power relations through more student participation and input. O'Toole's Sweet and Wolf Hill studies are specifically concerned with the binaries separating the conductor and the singers. While this at first does not appear to pertain to gender directly, decentering the conductor aims to address the issue of positionality. 
In the context of this research design, positionality refers to the social and political contexts that influence how gender is viewed and formed. While all choir members bring their own diverse perspectives to the group, exploring new possibilities is limited if there is an unbalance of power. This aims to adopt a bottom-up approach to power and offer more possible routes for future practice. As outlined by Wolf Hill, this collaborative approach is student-driven and adopts strategies that include group discussion and the reconfiguration of traditional choral formations. The first strategy involves the allocation of time during rehearsals for group discussion. Group discussions allow students to discuss and make decisions on classroom content, such as the structure of rehearsals and the allocation of solos and repertoire. In addition, discussions invite students to reflect on musical decisions rather than merely responding to a conducting gesture or the instructions of a musical score. Group discussion also provide an opportunity for students to give feedback to their peers. Hess recommends encouraging students to take turns in listening to the choir perform to gain a perspective on how the choir sounds. This also allows students to provide peer feedback concerning the group's musical decisions rather than the conductor. Group discussions provide an opportunity to discuss issues related to voice change, allowing students to explore and discuss the impact of voice change on their singing. Research conducted by Freya found adolescents who understood voice change, who, who understood voice change to be a natural and sequential process that impacts all adolescents are less likely to draw negative conclusions about their vocal abilities and more likely to continue to sing than those who lacked this knowledge. The second strategy emerging from this research is reconfiguring choral formations to physically displace the conductor. Choirs in the Western art music tradition typically place the conductor in front of the singers, who are then organised into voice parts. Wolf Hill suggests that the central location of the conductor separate from the rest of the choir physically reaffirms their hierarchical status in relation to the other choir members. O'Toole argues that the displacement of the conductor works to not only physically but metaphorically dissenter them. These researchers recommend different formations emerging from their studies, including circular formations that resemble drum circles, or moving around the room while singing. Rehearsing in spaces beyond the usual rehearsal rooms, such as the playground or a sports centre, allow the choir to experiment with different formations that may otherwise go unexplored. Navigating formations outside of a typical setting reduces the risk of falling into routine formations. Group discussions and working in small groups also provided opportunities to to disrupt the traditional choral formations. An example of these collaborative strategies in practice can be drawn on O'Toole's study. In collaboration with the choral conductor, these students created a lesson plan based on their musical interests. The lesson began with students grouped in voice parts to learn a piece orally from a recording. The conductor was on hand to isolate parts on the piano if the students required it. With students taking turns leading the choir, they then rehearsed as a group, gradually incorporating each voice part. The students then participated in group discussions facilitated by the conductor to discuss any musical decisions that needed to be considered, such as dynamics, phrasing and tempo. This included a discussion regarding the text and how the meaning conveyed impacts the group's musical decisions. The choir then trialled the ideas generated by the discussion and students took turns actively listening to provide the group with peer feedback. O'Toole refers to this student-directed learning as differently inspiring knowledge that uses affective learning to incorporate students' musical interests rather than the conductor's perspectives on what should be learned or how the choir should sound. O'Toole's concept of differently acquiring knowledge speaks directly to what Lucy Green describes as informal learning. In O'Toole's research, 
the conductor acted as a facilitator and a collaborator. Continuing from this study, in a study titled Going Green, the researchers applied informal learning in a choral setting using minimal intervention from the choral teacher. This research investigated the efficacy of informal learning in a secondary school choir based on Green's definitions of informal learning. In this study, students worked in smaller friendship groups where they discussed and decided on repertoire that they were interested in learning. Like O'Toole's study, the students learned pieces orally. However, the music was arranged by the students, composing and improvising their own harmonies that suited their voices. Finally, the students performed for, their, for the other members of the class. This study integrated listening, performing, improvising and composing throughout the learning process. Informal learning strategies may offer opportunities to deconstruct gender in a choral setting, as voice parts are not gendered. This also caters to adolescent voice change as the voice parts are composed and arranged by the students to match their own abilities. The next set of strategies I will discuss aim to address gender binaries in a choral classroom by introducing gender inclusive practice. Researchers Sims, Palki and Aguirre trouble the binary categories of female and male and aim to intentionally disrupt discourse that enforces binary perceptions of gender. The strategies outlined by Palki, Sims and Aguirre include the use of gender inclusive language, voice parts, repertoire and uniforms. As outlined by Derrida, we need to be alert to the implications and historical sedimentation of the language that we use. While language is necessary, it limits the possibilities of identity. Gender inclusive practice avoids terms that enforce binaries eliminating assumptions regarding gender. Examples of this include the use of student names or the pronoun they in place of gendered pronouns such as she or he or using pronouns preferred by the students. Aguirre suggests naming ensembles with gender neutral titles rather than women's or men's choruses. Palki recommends the use of non-gendered formations to allow singers to move parts that are comfortable for their range as their voices develop. This is particularly relevant for adolescents experiencing voice change as they can continually assess which part is most suitable for their voice. Palki criticizes gendered voice parts for promoting the narrative that singing high notes is effeminate. Palki suggests that genderless formations and voice parts encourage students to explore their voices and range outside of gendered stereotypes. However, to completely deconstruct gender in a choral setting, Palki's recommendation is the use of high, middle or low or numbered sections. Considering the collaborative nature of these strategies, Wolfhill suggests how voice parts are referred to should be decided in consultation with the singers. Regarding uniforms, Palki recommends that students should be allowed to wear clothes that reflect their identity rather than a gendered uniform during rehearsals and performances. Another strategy to emerge from this research is gender inclusive repertoire selection. This research promotes repertoire selections that offer a wide variety of identities to avoid gendered stereotypes, such as referring to girls as sweet or boys as strong. Palki suggests that conductors should study texts carefully to identify binaries that reinforce stereotypes. Much of the literature addressing the issue of missing males in choral settings often suggests selecting masculine repertoire such as barbershop quartets and sporting songs to appeal to males. However, feminist research suggests that this perception reinforces binary gendered stereotypes that reduce male participation in the first place. In turn, this forces the stereotype of femininity onto females leaving no space for those who identify outside of these binaries, yet again focusing attention on males. 
Palki recommends a selection of repertoire that models a spectrum of identity. Bond suggests that repertoire from diverse musical traditions can provide multiple perspectives of gender and increase student awareness not only regarding their own identity but the identities of their peers. Sim suggests that providing opportunities for students to discuss and select their own repertoire allows students to choose music that reflects their identities. Encouraging students to decide on repertoire connects their home and school experiences, making learning more relevant to their daily lives while simultaneously introducing them to the perspectives of others. Aguirre suggests that initiating discussions regarding gendered stereotypes and binaries in choral texts will encourage students to consider the implications of texts on their perceptions of gender and their own identity. According to Aguirre, Sims and Palki, repertoire selection for singers experiencing voice change must consider their limited ability to negotiate rapid pitches, rhythms and dynamics during voice change. Repertoire positioned in the lower vocal range that moves in a descending motion will strengthen the muscles of students who are experiencing unease in their sound production. Choral teachers may further ease students' discomfort by transposing and composing parts for the students who cannot do so themselves, or allowing students to sing in a comfortable octave. This study will occur in a co-educational secondary school, as this research concerns adolescents aged around 11 to 18 years of age. This is also the age group where voice change is most prevalent. As a participant researcher, I will act as the choir leader and the participants will be school age students recruited within the school. A participant researcher is fully immersed as a participant but uses their position to conduct the research. The study design employs participatory action research or PAR to investigate the teaching strategies identified in the literature. Participatory action research refers to action oriented research which places participants as equal partners in the research process. By inviting adolescent choral participants to become co-researchers, PAR aims to bring about social change by generating practical knowledge. Action takes place through the application and monitoring of the identified strategies in a choral setting. Through PAR, the strategies identified in the literature will act as a springboard to disrupt gender binaries such as female and male. This disruption attempts to address the limitations of gendered practice in a choral setting and in turn offer a more sophisticated understanding of the participants' narratives. In conclusion, this research design outlined in this paper aims to support gender inclusion and adolescent voice change in Australian school choirs. Gender-based choral practice promotes male-centric practice, gendered stereotypes and gender binaries, leaving no room to incorporate gender-inclusive practice. Conversely, feminist literature employs a range of strategies to deconstruct hierarchy and binaries to support gender inclusion and voice change. Through the application of participatory action research conducted in a co-educational high school setting, student participants and myself as the researcher will act as co-researchers to explore and analyze strategies that aim to support gender inclusion and adolescent voice change. By removing socially constructed gendered binaries, this research aims to identify alternative discourses through gender inclusive strategies in a choral setting. This aims to make a small contribution to the gap of the, in the literature regarding strategies that choral teachers can employ to support gender inclusion and voice change in adolescent choirs. Due to the success of these strategies in, in adult choral settings, as suggested by Aguirre that these strategies are likely to be successful in a choral classroom. Through these gender inclusive strategies, choral teachers can challenge gender binaries in a choral setting to promote gender inclusion to support all students. 
Thank you for listening, and here is a list of my references.